This is chapter 20 of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, Sitting in a Circle, Part 2. The students gather round, leaning on their shovels. I brush away the layer of old leaves, flaky and fragrant like aged pipe tobacco. I take out my knife and make the first incision through the duff, not deep enough to sever veins or muscle, just a superficial slice through the forest skin. Slide my fingers beneath that cut edge and pull back. The top layer peels away and I set it aside for safekeeping to replace when we are done. A centipede runs blindly in the unaccustomed light. A beetle dives for cover. Laying open the soil is like a careful dissection, and there's the same astonishment among the students at the orderly beauty of the organs, the harmony of how they rest against one another, form to function. These are the viscera of the forest. Against the black humus, colors stand out like neon lights on a dark, wet street. Juicy school bus orange, gold thread roots crisscross the ground. A web of creamy roots, each as thick as a pencil, connects all the sarsaparillas. Chris says right away, it looks like a map. With roads of different colors and sizes, it really does. There are interstates of heavy red roots whose origins I do not know. We tug on one, and a few feet away, a blueberry bush jounces in reply. White tubers of Canada Mayflower are connected by translucent threads, like country roads between villages. A mycelial fan of pale yellow spreads out from a clump of dark, organic matter, like the small dead-end streets of a cul-de-sac. A great, dense metropolis of fibrous brown roots emanates from a young hemlock. They all have their hands in it now, tracing the lines, trying to match the root colors to the above-ground plants. Reading the map of the world. The students think they've seen soil before. They've dug in their gardens, planted a tree, held a handful of freshly turned earth, warm, crumbly, and ready for a seed. But that handful of tilled soil is a poor cousin to the soil of the forest, as a pound of hamburger is to the whole blooming pasture of cows and bees and clover, of meadowlarks, woodchucks, and all that binds them together. Backyard soil is like ground meat. It may be nutritious, but it has been homogenized beyond recognition of its origins. Humans make agricultural soils by tilling. Forest soils simply make themselves through a web of reciprocal processes that few have the chance to witness. Carefully lift away the sod of herb roots and the soil beneath is as black as morning java before the cream. Humus, moist and dense, black flower as silky as the finest coffee grounds. There is nothing, quote-unquote, dirty about soil. This soft black humus is so sweet and clean you could eat it by the spoonful. We have to excavate a bit of this gorgeous soil to find the tree roots and sort out which is which. The maples, birches, and cherries are too brittle. We only want spruce. The spruce roots you can tell by feel. They are taut and springy. You can pluck one like a guitar spring and it twangs against the ground, resilient and strong. Those are the ones that we are looking for. Slip your fingers around it. Tug, and it starts to pull up from the ground, leading you off to the north, so you clear a little channel in that direction, 
to free it. But then its path is intersected by another coming in from the east, straight and sure as if it knows where it's going. So you excavate there too. Dig some more, and then there are three. Before long, it looks like a bear has been clawing up the ground. I go back to the first, cut an end free, and then duck it under the others, over, under, over, under. I am separating a single wire in the scaffold that holds up the forest. But I find that it can't be freed without unraveling the others. A dozen roots are exposed, and somehow you need to choose one and follow it without breaking it, so that you have one great, long, continuous strand. It is not easy. I send the students off gathering to read the land and see where it says roots. They go crashing off through the woods, their laughter flashing bright in the dim coolness. For a time, they continue to call to each other, loudly cursing the flies biting under the edge of their untucked shirts. They disperse so as not to concentrate the harvest in any one spot. The root mat is easily as big as the canopy above. Harvesting a few roots won't cause real harm, but we are careful to repair the damage we do. I remind them to fill in the furrows we've made, set the gold thread and the mosses back in place, and empty their water bottles over their wilting leaves when the harvest is done. I stay at my patch, working my roots and listening to the chatter slowly subside. I hear an occasional grunt of frustration nearby, a splutter when soil flies up in someone's face. I know what their hands are doing and sense where their minds are as well. Digging spruce roots takes you someplace else. The map in the ground asks you over and over which route to take. Which is the scenic route? Which is the dead end? The fine route you'd chosen and so carefully excavated suddenly dives deep under a rock where you can't follow. Do you abandon that path and choose another? The roots may spread out like a map, but a map only helps if you know where you want to go. Some roots branch, some break. I look at the students' faces, poised midway between childhood and adulthood. I think the tangle of choices speaks clearly to them. Which route to take? Isn't that always the question? Before long, all the chatter ceases and a mossy hush befalls us. There is just the shh of wind in the spruces and a calling winter wren. Time goes by way longer than the 50-minute classes they're used to. Still, no one speaks. I'm waiting for it, hoping. There is a certain energy in the air, a hum. And then I hear it, someone singing, low and contented. I feel the smile spread across my face and breathe a sigh of relief. It happens every time. In the Apache language, the root word for land is the same as the word for mind. Gathering roots holds up a mirror between the map in the earth and the map of our minds. This is what happens, I think, in the silence and the singing and with hands in the earth. At a certain angle of that mirror, the roots converge, and we find our way back home. Recent research has shown that the smell of humus exerts a physiological effect on humans. Breathing in the scent of Mother Earth stimulates the release of the hormone oxytocin, the same chemical that promotes bonding between mother and child, between lovers. Held in loving arms, no wonder we sing in response. 
I remember the first time I dug roots. I came looking for raw materials, for something I could transform into a basket, but it was me who was transformed. The crisscross patterns, the interweaving of colors, the basket was already in the ground, stronger and more beautiful than any I could make. Spruce and blueberries, deer flies and winter wren, the whole forest held in a wild native basket the size of a hill. Big enough to hold me, too. We rendezvous back at the trail and show off our coils of root, the guys bragging about whose is biggest. Elliot stretches his out on the ground and lies next to it, more than eight feet from toes to outstretched fingertips. It went right through a rotten log, he says, so I went too. Yeah, mine too, adds Claudia. I think it was following the nutrients. Most of their coils are shortish pieces, but the stories are longer. A sleeping toad mistaken for a rock, a lens of buried charcoal from a long-ago fire, a root that suddenly broke and showered Natalie in soil. I loved it. I didn't want to stop, she says. It's like the roots were just waiting there for us. My students are always different after root gathering. There is something tender in them and open, as if they are emerging from the embrace of arms they did not know were there. Through them, I get to remember what it is to open to the world as gift, to be flooded with the knowledge that the earth will take care of you, everything you need, right there. We also show off our root-gathering hands, black to the elbow, black under every nail, black in every crevice like a ritual glove of henna, our nails like tea-stained china. See, says Claudia, pinkies raised for tea with the queen. I got the special spruce root manicure. On the way back to camp, we stop at the stream to clean the roots. Sitting on rocks, we soak them a while, along with our bare feet. I show them how to peel the roots with a little vice made of a split sapling. The rough bark and fleshy cortex strip away like a dirty sock from a slender white leg. Beneath, the root is clean and creamy. It spools around your hand like thread, but will dry as hard as wood. It smells clean and sprucy. After unweaving the roots from the ground, we sit by the brook and weave our first baskets. With beginner's hands, they turn out lopsided, but they hold us nonetheless. Imperfect they may be, but I believe they are a beginning of a reweaving of the bond between people and the land. The wigwam roof goes on easily as the students sit on each other's shoulders to reach the top and tie the bark in place with roots. Pulling cattails and bending saplings, they remember why we need each other. In the tedium of weaving mats and with the absence of iPods, storytellers emerge to relieve the boredom, and songs arise to keep the fingers flying as if they remembered this, too. In our time together, we've built our classroom, feasted on cattail kebabs, roasted rhizomes, and eaten pollen pancakes. Our bug bites were soothed by cattail gel and there are cordage and baskets to finish. So, in the roundness of the wigwam, we sit together, twining and talking. I tell them how Daryl Thompson, a Mohawk elder and scholar, once sat with us as we made cattail baskets. It makes me so happy, he said, to see young people getting to know this plant. She gives us all that we need to live. 
Cattails are a sacred plant and appear in the Mohawk creation stories. As it turns out, the Mohawk word for cattail has much in common with the Potawatomi word. Their word also refers to cattails in the cradle board, but with a twist so lovely that tears spring to my eyes. In Potawatomi, the word means, we wrap the baby in it. In Mohawk, it means that the cattail wraps humans in her gifts, as if we were her babies. In that one word, we are carried in the cradle board of Mother Earth. How can we ever reciprocate such a wealth of care? Knowing that she carries us, could we shoulder a burden for her? I'm mulling over how to ask this when Claudia edges in with a comment that mirrors my thoughts. I don't mean this to sound disrespectful or anything. I think it's great to ask the plants if we can take them and give them tobacco. But is that enough? We are taking an awful lot of stuff. We were pretending like we were shopping for cattails, right? But we just took all this stuff without paying for it. When you really think about it, we just shoplifted at the swamp. And she's right. If cattails are the Walmart of the marsh, then the security alarms at the exits would be blaring at our canoes full of stolen merchandise. In a sense, unless we find a way to enter into reciprocity, we are walking away with goods for which we have not paid. I remind them that the gift of tobacco is not a material one, but a spiritual gift, a means of conveying our highest regard. I've asked some elders about this over the years and heard a range of answers. One man said that gratitude is our only responsibility. He cautioned against the arrogance of thinking that we have the capacity to give back to Mother Earth anything approaching what she gives us. I honor the Edbe Senduin, the humility inherent in that perspective. And yet it seems to me we humans have gifts in addition to gratitude that we might offer in return. The philosophy of reciprocity is beautiful in the abstract, but the practical is harder. Having your hands busy tends to free up your mind, and the students play with the idea as we twine cattail fiber between our fingers. I ask them what we can possibly offer cattail or birch or spruce. Lance snorts the idea. They're just plants. It's cool that we can use them, but it's not like we owe them anything. They're just there. The others groan and look at me, waiting for a reaction. Chris is planning to go to law school, so he takes over the conversation like a natural. He says, If cattails are free, then they're a gift, and all we owe is gratitude. You don't pay for a gift, you just graciously accept. Accept. But Natalie objects. Just because it's a gift, does that make you any less beholden? You should always give something back. Whether it's a gift or a commodity, you still have incurred an unpaid debt. One moral, the other legal. So, were we to act ethically, don't we have to somehow compensate the plants for what we received? I love listening to them consider such a question. I don't believe that average Walmart shoppers stop to consider their debt to the land that has produced their purchases. The students ramble and laugh as we work and weave, but come up with a long list of suggestions. Brad proposes a permit system in which we do pay for what we take, a fee to the state that goes to support wetland protection. A couple of kids take the route of generating appreciation for wetlands, proposing school workshops on the value of cattails. 
They also suggest defensive strategies to reciprocate with protection against the things that threaten cattails, to organize pulls of invasive species like phragmites or purple loosestrife, to go to a town planning board meeting and speak up for wetland preservation, to vote. Natalie promises to get a rain barrel at her apartment to reduce water pollution. Lance swears that he'll boycott fertilizing the lawn next time his parents give him that chore to stop runoff, to join Ducks Unlimited or the Nature Conservancy. Claudia vows to weave coasters of cattail and give them to everyone for Christmas, so they'll remember to love wetlands whenever they use them. I thought that they would have no answer, but I was humbled by their creativity. The gifts they might return to cattails are as diverse as those the cattails gave them. This is our work to discover what we can give. Isn't this the purpose of education? To learn the nature of your own gifts and how to use them for good in the world? As I listen to them, I hear another whisper from the swaying stand of cattails, from spruce boughs in the wind, a reminder that caring is not abstract. The circle of ecological compassion we feel is enlarged by direct experience of the living world and shrunken by its lack. Had we not waded waist-deep in the swamp, had we not followed muskrat trails and rubbed ourselves with soothing slime, had we never made a spruce root basket or eaten cattail pancakes, would they even be debating what gifts they could offer in return? In learning reciprocity, the hands can lead the heart. On the last night of the course, we decide to sleep in our wigwam, hauling our sleeping bags down the trail at dusk and laughing around the fire until late. Claudia says, I'm sad to leave here tomorrow. I'm going to miss feeling so connected to the land when I'm not sleeping on cattails. It takes real effort to remember that it's not just in a wigwam that the earth gives us everything we need. The exchange of recognition, gratitude, and reciprocity for these gifts is just as important in a Brooklyn flat as under a birch bark roof. When the students start to leave the fire circle with their flashlights in twos and threes to whisper, I sense a conspiracy. Before I know it, they are lined up with makeshift song sheets, like a choir in the firelight. We have a little something for you, they say, and start a marvelous anthem of their own creation, filled with crazy rhymes of spruce roots and hiking boots, human needs and marshy reeds, cattail torches on our porches, the song crescendos to a rousing chorus of No matter where I roam, when I'm with plants, I'll be at home. I couldn't imagine a more perfect gift. With all of us packed into the wigwam like down caterpillars, the slow slide to sleep is punctuated by laughs and last scraps of conversation. Remembering the improbable rhyme of Ecotones and baked rhizomes, I started to giggle too, sending a ripple across the sleeping bags like a wave across a pond. As we eventually drift off, I feel us all held beneath the dome of our bark roof, an echo of the starry dome above. The quiet settles in until all I can hear is their breathing and the whisper of the cattail walls. I feel like a good mother. And when the sun pours in the eastern door, Natalie wakes first, tiptoes over the others, and steps outside. Through the slits in the cattails, I watch as she raises her arms and speaks her thanks to the new day. 
This has been Chapter 20 of Braiding Sweetgrass, Sitting in a Circle, Part 2, written by Robin Wall Kimmerer, read by Sen Naomi Kirst Schultz.